In this lesson, we're going to have a look at the factors that determine the climate of an area. So we're going to take a more global perspective here rather than just a local one. Uh, and one of the biggest factors, of course, is this one, insulation. Now watch that O. We don't mean insulation like you have in your attic. We mean how much sunlight an area receives, right? How much sunlight do you get? Uh, and of course, as you can get, th that depends upon your latitude. If you're in the tropics, you get a lot of sunlight. If you're way off to the north of the South Pole, you get a lot less. That's going to have a huge impact upon your climate. Of course, there's other things. There's how much cloud cover you have, because we know that clouds can reflect heat back to the Earth. And if you don't have many clouds, the heat will escape. Albedo, of course, is the reflectivity of the surface. We know that snow-colored surfaces reflect a lot of heat back out again. And how much atmospheric dust do you have? Because the dust, of course, scatters the light and is involved in the absorption of heat. We've also got to remember that there are basic global wind patterns that we've talked about before that are established on the planet. For example, things like the westerlies. And of course, we've also got to take into consideration the warm and cold ocean currents and the effect they have upon the temperature of the land that surrounds them. And of course, that's a big deal because water has a very high specific heat capacity and has a dramatic effect upon the heating and cooling of a region. Well, one of the ways in which we make sense of uh, places on the planet is to create what's called a climatograph, or sometimes it's just called a climate graph of that region. And, and what we do is this. We, we, we measure the precipitation here. We measure the rainfall uh, as bars, and we measure the temperature as a line. And uh, what's important here is if we're going to compare places, it's really important that their scales, so for example their temperature scales over here, uh, make sure that they measure the, by the same scale. So when we make our climatic graphs in class, we're going to make sure we all agree on the same scale. And ditto with over here, their precipitation measured in centimeters, uh, make sure you're using the same measurement. So here we have climatic graphs of three different places, and you can see some pretty interesting differences here. Uh, for example, especially here, look at uh, in Australia Australia, this place. Look at the lack of rainfall they have uh, during um, during the uh, June, July, August, and September during the summer months. Whereas here in Africa, look at the incredible amount of rainfall that they have. Just the opposite. For example, here's a couple of climate graphs that compare White Horse in the Yukon with Lerwick in the United Kingdom, and and it, we can tell right off the bat that they are different. So those bars of precipitation are quite different in the two locations, and, and so are their temperatures. But there's a problem with this climatograph, and that is if you look at their temperature scale, notice how the White Horse temperature scale goes down to minus 30, whereas the United Kingdom one here only goes down to zero. And so here's a classic case where the temperature scales of these two climate graphs uh, don't match, and this can make it really, really hard to, to make a comparison. I mean, over here on Whitehorse, there's where the zero line for temperature is over there. A ditto with their scale that they're using for their precipitation. Uh, you can see here that the one in Whitehorse goes from zero centimeters to a maximum of 45, whereas this one over here goes from zero way up to 160. So it can be very, very challenging to compare climatographs if you don't use the same vertical scales for your temperature and for your precipitation. Here's another big uh, effect that we have on planet Earth, and that's called the Southern Oscillation, known to most people as El Nino and La Nina. And what's basically going on here is the movement of heat uh, in the South Pacific Ocean. When we have an El Nino year, we get an awful lot of warm water that accumulates off the coast of uh, South America. Um, this typically happens around uh, Christmas time, and that's why it's called El Nino, named after the, the birth of Christ at Christmas. Uh, what we have here then is the evaporation of a lot of, uh, of moist air here, and so this part of South America is going to get uh, a lot of rainfall. But meanwhile, uh, as that circulates over here, when it gets back over across the Pacific, it's going to be very, very hot and dry. So we know that in an El Nino year, Australia is going to suffer some drought, whereas uh, South America is going to get an awful lot of rainfall. Now the opposite of that is what's called La Nina, which is the feminine version of El Nino, and, and instead of the heat accumulating off the coast of South America, this time the hot water accumulates uh, over on the other side of the Pacific, over by Australia, and so when they get a La Nina event over there in Australia, they're going to get an awful lot of rainfall and flooding that they have to worry about. Meanwhile, over here in South America, it's going to be very, very dry. Now, this also has a, an effect uh, global-wide, so here's two maps of the Earth, one showing an El Nino year, in which you can expect, and uh, the blue means heavy rain, whereas the uh, the yellow or the orange means uh, a lot of drought. Uh, and then the other map shows uh, La Nina, and again, blue is rain, whereas the uh, orange stuff is, uh, is drought. Um, and so, for example, we know in our location where we live that if we have an El Nino year, 
where we're located, it's going to be pretty dry. Whereas if we have a La Nina year, we're going to get some precipitation. And, and to put that into perspective for you living here in Pincher Creek, what that means is when we have a La Nina year uh, in wintertime, we're going to have some pretty good uh, skiing because we're going to get a lot of precipitation. Whereas if it's an El Nino year, it's going to be pretty hard to find some decent snow out there.